We continue with the Hilchot Shabbat. We are now in Siman Resh Mem Het 288 in Shulhan Aruch. And there's a longer discussion in Aruch Shulhan that we will look up later. Um, and that comes after the laws of uh, conducting business and setting machinery or stuff like that before Shabbat. Maybe I should have mentioned um, the, when, when we spoke about uh, your, your uh, instruments or uh, devices doing work on Shabbat, the question of a timer, um, but let's, let's do it here. There are those who say that you cannot use a timer on Shabbat for various reasons. I'm not going to go into them. So you know that if you want to be uh, strict uh, and not use it on Shabbat, or if you want to be lenient and not use it on Shabbat, um, lenient because you allow yourself not to enjoy certain things that you can enjoy on Shabbat, you're, there's, there's an opinion that you could rely on. Uh, but if you want to be strict and do use a timer on Shabbat, and said you could set everything from before Shabbat, there's no problem. The problem is, for some people, it was of perception, but now everything is accessible and available through timers. Um, you could even set up, if you want, your coffee maker and your, uh, your bread machine, if it's automatic, to uh, bake for you fresh buns when you wake up uh, Shabbat morning. I don't think that you, we need, that you need that, but if you do it, it's not a problem. As long as uh, something was set from before Shabbat and then goes on automatically, it's fine. Uh, the, a support for that we could find in the Halakha and the Mishnah. It's not, it's not clear what the Mishnah says there, but according to one interpretation, the Mishnah speaks about putkin ma'im lagina, that you get the uh, water your garden from Friday, starting on Friday, with something that resembles the dripping system. So, um, according to one interpretation, it's done by removing one stone from the from the, the fence or the wall that blocks the water from uh, reaching your field. And but when you remove the stone, the water doesn't come through yet. It takes the water twelve hours or more to trickle until it starts getting to the garden. So this is the the one case that we have a timer that is mentioned in the Mishnah, and the Mishnah says it's fine. So from that, all these discussions of um, the things that you could do before Shabbat, we get to this siman, Resh Memhet, which is written in a totally different environment and, and seat in life than what we have today. Um, even though the, the, the title sounds similar to something that we have today. And what is this? Din hamaflik bisfina ve'olech b'shayara b'shabbat. So the halachot of someone who boards a ship or who sails in a ship or who travels with a caravan on Shabbat. So I'm saying that it's different because uh, most people who sail today do it, I mean, at least among observant Jews not living in Israel, most of them do it for fun, it's uh, for leisure. They will go on cruise ships, but not for travel. The very few people uh, in our societies, in our in the developed world, travel on ships from place to place unless they're, uh, they have this uh, paralyzing fear of flying, so they will travel by ship. And in Israel, of course, you would have people who are in the Navy, who are observant people, but those are usually people who are uh, in military service, so they do it as part of their military service. But what we're speaking about here, Dina Maflik Bisfina, we are talking about people who do it for work, um, usually from country to country, and the same follows for Shayara B'Shabbat, which is something that uh, I think, I'm trying to think of a situation where we would be stuck in a caravan on Shabbat. I mean, unless you're hiking uh, with a group across the Sahara uh, or Death Valley, I don't think that you'll be in such a situation, but let's say that you're there, uh, but not coming today. So traveling with a caravan on Shabbat, those, uh, those caravans used to, uh, to be on the road for months on end, weeks, but sometimes months. Uh, there's a very, very intriguing book called The City of Light, written by Yaakov Ancona, who was a merchant from Venice, who traveled from Venice uh, 
or maybe from Ancona to uh, to China. So he boards a ship and he sails for months to Eretz Israel, and then he's on a caravan with camels and horses for months until he gets to China. So those are things that were common uh, at the time, not very common today. So those are caravans. They organize huge uh, caravans, animals, guards, etc., to traverse the, the desert. You can't stop on Shabbat. There are nice legends about the rabbi who had the caravan to stop on Shabbat. They didn't stop, and then he wrote a line. It's good my wife doesn't hear me because she likes the story. But uh, um, but I, I doubted that this, this really happened. That they, you couldn't really expect the shayara, the caravan, to stop for you. The halacha does not uh, mandate that. So let's start with the, the, that introduction. Let's start the saif. He says this, Mutar laflik bisfina filu be'erev Shabbat im olech lidvar mitzvah you're allowed to board a ship even on Friday if you are traveling for a mitzvah. Um, and you ask the captain that you tell the captain that you want him to uh, uh, to stop the ship on Shabbat or not to do forbidden activities on Shabbat. And if later on the captain does not respect this agreement, nothing happened. So here again, remark, this is about perception, right? Because we said that the non-Jew can do for the Jew whatever he wants, but we have to, we have, to have the perception of keeping Shabbat. So the, the Jew has to make his part by asking, don't travel on Shabbat. And the captain says, okay, and then it's fine. But if you're traveling for Rishut, which uh, would be, at the time, maybe uh, for, for commerce, then you have to be in the ship at, le- at least three days before Shabbat. And now this is not about being on the ship, but rather how you feel, because the, um, <coughs> he explains it in Saif Bet, Atam den mafligin, mishum onek Shabbat, shekor shlosha yamim arishonim, yesh lahem tsar uvilbul, the, the, the first three days, you, you could be seasick. And, uh, and therefore, if you, you boarded on, on Thursday, on Shabbat, you still feel very uncomfortable. So we don't want you to lose your Onik Shabbat. Uh, and that is only if you sail in the ocean, probably for, because of the strong winds. But if you sail in a river, uh, usually it's a, it's a smooth ride, so you could even uh, board the ship on Erev Shabbat. Um, that is given, So, but that, that is in a river that is deeper than, uh, than 10 Fahim, which most rivers are. You don't sail on a big ship in a river that is less than three feet high because the, the ship will get stuck. So, uh, but, but if it is, you can't do it because it's so tummy because you're basically walking on the ground. But above 10 for him, there's no problem. Um, and we'll see that this, this issue of Onik Shabbat becomes uh, an issue with a very modern problem, which is uh, being on an airplane on Shabbat, which is possible. If you travel on certain flights from the west coast of the United States to the Far East, you could do the you could do that in I think thirteen to seventeen hours uh, or less, less than seventeen hours. You you leave before Shabbat and you get to the Far East after Shabbat. So you did not board or uh, disembark from the airplane on Shabbat, but you were on the plane the whole Shabbat. There are uh, obviously debates about that. The poskim don't feel comfortable that people would do that. People don't feel comfortable that the poskim tell them not to do that because sometimes that's their only option. If they travel for business, that's the only time they could catch whatever between one conference to another. What do you do if you need to do that? The answer is technically it would be permissible um, because unless, unless you know that you're going to suffer tremendously 
when you're on the plane. If you know that this will not interfere with your own Shabbat, you can be on the plane. Um, and most of the things, you know, you're not doing anything uh, which, which causes transgression on, of Shabbat. So it shouldn't be a tra- problem. It's the same as sailing on a ship. But it does look strange to a lot of people. Um, so, but we get into uh, more details. What Rabbi, Rabbi, can I, are, are we going to come back to that issue, the airplane issue? Uh, I think so, but don't bring it, in, it's, please don't say. Yeah, I, yeah. I just want to, I just want to understand this clearly. So the permissibility of being on an airplane during Shabbat yeah. uh, needs to be that you're on the airplane for the entire duration of Shabbat, right? You wouldn't uh, want the plane, you wouldn't be able to depart, you know, leave the plane during Shabbat or board the plane, right? So the uh, whole, sh- whole, the entire Shabbat has to happen. And usually when you're traveling over date lines, international date lines, that does happen. Right, um, that can happen. Um, so I would say that ideally, yes, that um, ideally the, the uh, allowance should be limited only to a case where you're on the plane the whole Shabbat. I would say that uh, as they say, lechatchila, deliberately, uh, you should not uh, schedule a, uh, a flight where you take off or land on Shabbat. I think that is definitely something that interferes with the feeling of Shabbat. Right. Uh, and, and I think not because of what happens on the plane, but what happens before and after. The, uh, uh, the tension in, in the airport and you know, things that could go wrong. And after, I just, you know, two weeks ago, I was supposed to go and... Uh, officiated a wedding in Israel right. and all I had to take is a, is a, a flight connection from Virginia near my house to Newark, New Jersey, and then to Israel. And that short connection of an hour and a half got delayed on the tarmac for three hours. And eventually I had to turn back and go home because I wouldn't make it to the wedding. I had to uh, ask a friend in Israel to, to conduct the wedding. Uh, wow. But just being there, uh, waiting in line, waiting for the, the airplane to take or not take off and come back, I felt like I was, I, it, took, it was seven hours out of the house and I felt jet lagged just from that. So ideally not. But if you are, uh, I think that, it, let's put it this way, if you're rushing to a certain place and it's imperative that you'll be there and the only flight that you could catch is on a Friday, uh, you know, it could happen, God forbid, I think the emergency that uh, would allow that, that does not involve a life-threatening situation. Because if there's a life-threatening situation, there are right, no questions no right, question asked, right? If you're the only doctor who could save lives on the other side of the world, you board a rocket ship if, if needed, you know, and, and get there. Um, but let's say, you know, I, I'm thinking of a scenario that um, a, a close relative passed away in Israel on Friday, and you know that no matter what you do, the Hevra Kadisha in Yerushalayim is not going to listen to, to logic. They're not going to be reasonable as they should be. Uh, and they're going to do the burial immediately on Motei Shabbat. And there's no way that you can make it if you leave on Motei Shabbat and you don't want to miss it. So I would say that in that case, yes, you should go. Um, have something, uh, have someone uh, maybe escort you and do all the things, uh, anything that has to do with uh, with physical transgression of Shabbat, but if it's uh, electric, um, you have you have your uh, usually you have your uh, flight information on your phone. You scan the the barcode. That's not a problem. Um, that's not that's not a transgression. That is is uh, I mean you could have someone else do it, but not not a big issue uh, when there is an emergency like that because that is really going to impact someone's life. That is on the way there. Um, and then you could, like I said, you could manage that uh, most of the, uh, the necessary things that happen on while boarding uh, the airplane would not, be involved, would not involve immediate transgression of Shabbat. I'm trying to think um, what could be, help me, if you think of anything that could happen from the time you get to the airport, I say, okay, you get to the airport with someone drives you, you're in an Uber or something like that, you're being dropped off, okay, you go through security, um, you don't do anything. You just show your stuff, right? You take your stuff. You go to the you go to the gate. You show your. That's it. Nothing. Nothing uh, involves 
Uh, right. And that, but this, again, that's, it, it's got to be an emergency because... I think, I think it should be an emergency say, to board the plane. Yeah, you could say immediately, you, you can't take luggage because you can't take luggage out of your house to the airport. Oh, no, no. <laughs> like, I mean, you, it's, I mean, how... You can take the luggage. Don't, don't go without luggage. It take, can go cra- I mean, it can get crazy when you're, yeah. if you're trying to break down the experience. No, no, so, to, so take the luggage because the luggage is only mukze. Um, for Eruv, in that case, you could rely on the opinion of Rabbi Misas, who says that we don't have Rishut Arabim today, so you can, you know, without an Eruv. And now the same happens, and I think this is much more common, uh, landing after Shabbat started. That is a, uh, I have a recorded episode on that. On I, know, I heard that one. Yeah. So you know that. Um, I mean, so if you break it technically, you could, uh, you, you, you land just shortly after Shabbat. So the problem with this El Al flight that was diverted and, and landed in Greece is that it should not have been diverted. You know, some, some, uh, the Orthodox uh, passengers on board demanded that we divert it. And, uh, yeah, the, the, maybe the airline should not have taken off, but they did. Once they were in the air, there was no problem. If they would have landed, it would have involved partial Hilul Shabbat of maybe the captain. The way they did it, they caused a, you know, wreaked havoc for everyone. Uh, but let's say we're not talking about such a situation. You're on a plane, you got delayed, you landed after Shabbat. What you do is you take your stuff, you get out, you, uh, you ask someone to stop a cab for you or something like that, and you get home and you enjoy your Shabbat, Onik Shabbat. Unless you feel that for you, that would be great, uh, you know, greater suffering than staying in the airport in the local hotel or sitting on a chair in the, in the uh, waiting area for the whole Shabbat. Right. So uh, I'm, I'm saying not forcing anyone to go back, but I think that uh, um, when I, what I have heard from people, their experiences when they got stuck in the airport, I think it makes sense to... Uh, to rely on all the lenient or strict opinion and get home um, for Shabbat and make it there. So um, let's go back one second to the Shohan Aruch and then to the Shohan. There are a lot of uh, a lot of concerns with transportation on Shabbat, where we're still on the issue of transportation before Shabbat. Um, so. סעיף ד' זה אינטרסטינג, היוצאים בשיירה במדבר, והכל יודעים שהם צריכים לחלל שבת, כי מפני הסכנה לא יוכלו לעכב במדבר בשבת לבדם, שלושה ימים קודם שבת אסורים לצאת, וביום ראשון ובשני ובשלישי מותר לצאת. So they will travel in the caravan through the desert, and like I said, it could take months, and everybody knows that you're going to be מחלל שבת because you'll have to keep on going, because it is dangerous to stay in the desert by yourself. That's why I said that this story about the rabbi, you know, riding a lion, staying alone in the desert, is, that doesn't fit the halakha. <clears throat> so the halakha is that shlosha yamim kodem shabbat asurim latzet. You're not allowed to leave on, from Wednesday on. But on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, you're allowed. Now, what, what is the reason? It's very interesting. Mishum dem nikraim al shem shabbat he'aval. ואין צריך להיזהר עתה שלא יבוא לידי חילול שבת הבא. זה uh, משנה ברורה, he says, Monday, sorry, Sunday to Tuesday are considered remnants of the previous Shabbat. So you don't consider actions that are done on those days as pertaining to the uh, incoming Shabbat. Um, but again, my, my interpretation here, it's an issue of perception, of how this is perceived by the people. And, uh, and that is important because there's no other way to do it. When you talk about a caravan, you live in Spain, you go to Israel, you live in Italy, you go to China, whatever, for, because you needed to do this, this commerce, this commercial route was important for the survival of the Jewish community of Italy, right? You have to do it. If you say, no, I'm not going because it's, not, it's Shabbat, you're not going to survive in the long term. So they understood it's not really forbidden. You're not going to do anything wrong. Um, even though you're, you'll be on the animal, but you'll be, uh, the riding an animal on Shabbat is rabbinical, riding through the desert is rabbinical, so they sort of waived all these understanding reality. Um, so on, if you leave on 
sorry, so what I want to say, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday belong, right, and Sunday, Monday, Tuesday are, yeah, those I said before, you could leave. So if you left on Sunday through Tuesday, and then because of danger, you had to transgress Shabbat, it is okay, and it's not considered Hilul Shabbat. Because when you left, that situation didn't exist, and when you get into a situation, you have to, you have to respond, and don't freeze there and say, oh, I should not have done that, now what is going to happen to me? Um, so if you decided to leave to go to Eretz Israel, and you hear last minute, remember the time when you could book last minute flights and they were cheaper? Not anymore, right? The, the, the more you wait, it becomes more expensive. But they had less last minute camel caravan. If you book it less, you know, you don't, you know, you just heard they're leaving now on Friday, and they're leaving to Eretz Israel. You could join them. That that shows the importance that the rabbis had for resettling in Eretz Israel. We'll see another interesting halacha like that when we get to the laws of ktiva of writing on Shabbat. That's already mentioned in the uh, in in the Talmud that. If you have the chance to buy a property in Eretz Israel, a Jew can buy from a non-Jew, and the sale is available only on Shabbat, Kotev you could go to a civil court, write the document, pay the money, sign, do everything. Later generations modified it because they felt uncomfortable. They said, no, you don't sign it yourself. You have someone else sign it for you, whatever. But the original halacha is that you write and sign on Shabbat because it's important to uh, resettle in Eretz Israel. Um, and the same thing, you, you ask them to rest on Shabbat and if they don't, you can go with them. Um, and Shabbat, So now if you enter the city on Shabbat, you could walk the whole city uh, and um, even if he was left outside the city and he needs to get into the city, he's allowed to do that, that because of Tehomim, because he left for a good reason, that, that is if someone left to go uh, to Eretz Israel. Now that becomes a problem of the Tehom of Shabbat when, you, uh, when you're on a ship and the ship does on Shabbat. When an airplane lands on Shabbat, it seems as if you are into the problem of Tehomim because you are, uh, Tehomim is 2,000 ama from the place where you started the Shabbat. That's where you're allowed to be. 2,000 amot is about 1,000, should be 1,000 feet, something like that. Not, not a big distance. So obviously if you, you were on an airplane, you pass this distance. But the point is that since you were uh, in the air, you didn't really uh, cover ground. So... Uh, from the place where you landed, that's that's where you have the tomb. And if we follow the ruling of Rav Yosef Mesas, again, when you have the necessity, you could you could go wherever you want. What happens with ships, uh, especially the cruise ship, dock on Shabbat, people get off and now they want to go and see the city. Can they do it or not? The answer is same for Onik Shabbat. Uh, if it's a kosher cruise, they plan it in advance. If not, you could join the rest of the group and, 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 and board the shuttle and go where necessary instead of imprisoning yourself on the ship or at the port, based, based on those two ideas that you were not really traveling at home because the ship is above, um, is above the, the ground with all the, the water that separates you from the ground. And then that when you get to the city, you could rely on the opinion of Rabbi Mesas, which we'll mention later on, that today we don't have the um, category of Rashut Arabim of public property. And since we don't have public property, we don't have Carmelite, uh, which is the buffer zone where you need the Eruv. So everything all around the world is Rishut Ayavid, and there's no problem of, of, uh, of carrying or traveling. So here, let's uh, conclude this Siman with reading the Haggah, because we, we didn't uh, 
clarify before what is Dvar Mitzvah, right? So Haga says this, Yesh Omrim, שכל מקום, כל מקום שאדם הולך לסחורה או לראות פני חברו, חשוב הכל דבר מצווה, ולא חשוב דבר הרשות, רק כשהולך לטייל. So say, what is the definition of מצווה? מצווה is when you go for uh, commercial reasons, for business, or to, to see a friend that you haven't seen for a while, so that is a מצווה. What is reshut? What is considered optional? When uh, you take a cruise for leisure. We could argue today, I think uh, maybe, I think that we probably understand that uh, a little better, that uh, sometimes, I mean, depending on the person, leisure also is a mitzvah, to relax, to, uh, um, to change, uh, atmosphere, so uh, that would be okay. But in any case, one could also argue that boarding a ship today, um, cruise ships, you don't, I mean, I actually never did that, so it depends on the person, you don't feel the same stress uh, as, as in their times when you boarded a, uh, a sail ship, you know, going through the ocean. Even though uh, must make reservations with a couple of uh, of uh, accidents and disaster that happened in the last decade with the Concordia toppling over in Italy. And I think last month a, in Venice, there was an accident with a, with, a, with a tugboat and viruses and stuff like that. Okay, that, that should be a personal consideration, how you feel and uh, what, what are you willing to do on a ship. So... Uh, any questions on that before we continue to Aruch Hashem Ham? Yeah, I have a question. Can you just remind me, um, just briefly, like what, on what basis Rabbi Messes is saying that there's no Birshut Arabim in today's day? Yeah, um, we'll, we'll, when we get to Chot Aruch, we'll discuss it uh, more in depth, but I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll mention that. Um, several poskim, say, including the Bet Yosef in his commentary to the tool, in Siman, I think it's 300 and, 308, that, um, that, and, and din reshut that we don't have today what is called public property. So, um, and there's just a statement that several hachamim make. Um, it seems like it boils down to the question of what defines reshut arabim that there is a debate between two schools of thought. One says that you need to have wide streets and a uh, traffic of 600,000 pedestrians. Whereas the other school says one of the conditions is enough. If you have only wide streets or only 600,000 people, that is enough. The, um, the reality is that in, in medieval times, cities didn't have, uh, most cities didn't have both. Uh, a traffic of 600,000 people going through a city was very uncommon, uh, and why it were uncommon. People argued to, that today we do have it, but I think that uh, uh, Rabbi Mes- Rabbi, what Rabbi Messas wrote, um, you could say that it was sort of an emergency measure, but I think that if you, if you, if you review, which I did, the, the development of the Halachot of Eruv from, from the very beginning, um, it seems that at a certain point, the rabbis wanted to uh, to find all possible ways to limit the problems of uh, the the most significant one is in already in Talmud Yerushalmi. Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish says that Reshut Rabim could only exist in a in a place which is completely flat. A plateau with no uh, no elevation, no inclines, uh, and he bases it on a pasuk that speaks about the coming of Mashiach. The valleys will become flattened, and the uh, and the mountains will 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 be uh, smoothed out. So it says that until that happens, you don't have a shutarbi. Then there are other allowances, such as the street has to go straight from one side to another. You have to have 600,000 people, men, walking through the place daily. Um, 
And if you, if you go with the opinion that you need both conditions, that doesn't uh, exist anywhere, even in the biggest cities, even if you think about New York or uh, uh, China, in China or uh, any other great city, the, um, there are certain, there, there's a volume of traffic that goes through the city, but not 600,000 people that go through one straight street that goes from one end to, of the city to another by foot. And also the requirement is that that road never closes, it's always open. It's not, and uh, so when you think about New York, for example, for the marathon, they, a lot of roads are being blocked. So you could do a roof anywhere. And Rabbi Misas takes it a step further and says, even without an roof, you're okay. The, um, the reason that a lot of people opposed him is, is not really uh, based on halacha, like in many other cases, but more on a gut feeling of saying, what are you saying? That we're not going to use Al-Chot of Eruv anymore? Um, and this is, he's like, yes, uh, that's that's what I'm saying. You know, maybe we get together as the rabbis and we say, this is the halacha, this is what we follow, and let us worry about other things instead of wasting tens of millions of dollars in communities over that issue. Uh, but we'll get there, Bezat Hashem. Um, so the Eruv, the... Uh, uh, Okay, let's let's go to Aruch Hashulchan. Um, yeah, more any anything on that issue? Okay, so and when we get to to Aruch Hashulchan, also I see Shaina's come and we'll talk about uh, natural barriers, uh, um, etc. Um, so. Aruch HaShohan adds here, and that, that has bearings on the issue of swimming on Shabbat. The, um, he, he brings some other explanation for the prohibition. The, uh, the Tosfot says that the, the, the prohibition is just there is a prohibition to float, it's, but it's a rabbinical decree. Why, why is this, there such a decree? Shema Yaseh Havich Shayatin. You end up uh, making a boat. So one could argue with this Gzera that, um, and that is a general uh, argument regarding Gzerot, that Gzerot or uh, such, such regulations or decrees are valid when, we, when, when the Gzera is a Gzera Shema. I, we don't want you to do this because it might lead you to that. So that kind of gzera only is only applicable when the undesired consequence is, uh, is probable. So we're moving from a society where people used to make their own vessels, used to make their own boats, to modern days where most people don't do that. Even if there are people among observant Jews who do that, they are a negligible minority. People don't make uh, sailing vessels. So there's no uh, reason to, be, to make a decree to not board a ship because you'll end up doing it on Shabbat. Of course, we don't, we're not changing the Gezerah of Hachamim. We're not saying that the Gezerah doesn't apply. It applies where you have that fear. Uh, similarly, there was a period where the, when the gzera of not playing music on Shabbat was lifted by some people, by the student of, of Nahmanides. This is uh, recorded in the Magen Avot, which is a book of Minhagim written by Rabbi Menachem Meiri uh, of Perpignan uh, in Provence. And the Meiri writes that the students of Nahmanides came from Spain to Provence and they play the harp on Shabbat. Menagnim bechinor b'Shabbat. And he rebuked them for that, and they stopped. I mean, eventually, he, he eradicated that. But it was a common practice among observant people. Where did it come from? I think that uh, their rationale was that the original decree against playing music on Shabbat was Shema Yetaken Klishil. Now, some people translate that 
uh, as fixing an instrument, but that's not the the Hebrew of the of the Mishnah. When the Mishnah says Shema Yetaken, it means you'll end up building. So don't play music on Shabbat because you'll end up building an instrument. And it seems like in medieval times when musical instruments became more and more sophisticated, most people were not music uh, musical instruments makers. I think a good a good proof for that is that the term luthier, which means a maker of musical instrument, is from about the same time. So that's where this new profession uh, appears. So the gzera was not uh, was not removed, rather the possibility of the Gzera being transgressed was considered. Uh, I have one more example I'm thinking of now, um, which is completely, completely, has completely been forgotten, and that is when we should actually we should reinstitute it, is blowing shofar on Shabbat. Why don't we blow shofar on Shabbat? It is mentioned in the in the Mishnah that we are we fear that someone will take the shofar and will carry it through a shuta rabim. So, um, in the time of the Geonim, there were people who chained the shofar to the teva in the synagogue. And, and they said, okay, this way we remove the possibility of the shofar being carried. So we see that if, if there is a way to make sure that the the outcome, the negative outcome they were trying to prevent will never happen, it's not a problem. Um, so that is the explanation of the Tosafot. Um, but remember that we read in uh, the Shohan Aru that it's about Onik Shabbat, that uh, that you're not you're not going to enjoy on Shabbat, and. And he mentions again also the three days, three days before Shabbat, uh, belong to the to the next Shabbat. Okay, mention in Surah Tchumim, that I mentioned before about the, the depth of the water. And in that we call Sarifa, Rambam Kadvu, Hata Mishum Onik Shabbat. The reason is Onik Shabbat. Um, it's nice to see how they describe it. Most people who go down to the sea, Shloshet Yemar Rishunim, Ruham Hubla, their spirit is uh, distorted. They can't think clearly. Some of them throw up. Some of them just lie down, they're unable to get up. And that's why you can't. Uh, that, that's why you can't sail uh, three days before Shabbat. But if you're selling for a mitzvah, there's no prohibition. So. This is where we have the the, the margin, uh, the flexibility of the law. So according to Baal Amor, Rabbi Zrahiya Levi of Cherona, is that it's just dangerous. But that, uh, and he says, but that is a, how we say it's a sort of really far-fetched uh, reason, because if that is the case, you can't sail ever in a ship, I mean, at, at least at their time, because you, you're, you're committing suicide. Um, and if the ship gets into a storm on Shabbat, what you're going to do is not necessarily direct Hilul Shabbat. So, uh, okay, he quotes another time by Ramban. I'm going to skip that one. Um, oh, actually, say. Ramban Katav, let's go back. Ramban Katav Tam Acher. Ramban says this, this prohibition is only when the ship goes only, uh, sails only for you. So that, that already takes off the hook all the people who sail on ships where the majority or 51%, yeah, a normal majority, 51% of the passengers are non-Jews. So this, it doesn't sail for you. But if it goes for you, the Hamoli Hasfina the, the captain or the, and the sailors would, would, uh, would have to do certain uh, uh, certain types of work which are forbidden on Shabbat and they do it only for you. Um, and all these things have ramifications to modern uh, modes of transportation, which we'll talk about. 
Um, and the Aruch HaShulchan concludes, Kodei Lamed Zechot al Kral Yisrael, Nira Lam Yudayat Yidem Yigufa De Baraita Yishraya Lishitat HaRamban Zal, it says that yeah, I can actually prove that Ramban is right, because the, the Baraita says that you must uh, ask the captain to, to cease from work on Shabbat. So that only applies when you, the Jew, are the owner of the ship or the owner of the journey. But if other people go with you, uh, if you think that we talk about but if you talk, let's say, about a cruise ship and you walk, you, you walk on, there are 3,000 passengers and you're the only Jew and you go to the captain and say, dude, can you do me a favor and stop the ship on Shabbat? He says, it's a joke. We know it's not going to happen. <coughs> Even to just say it is uh, we desecrate uh, God's name by just saying that. Um, okay. Now, he adds what, what we read in the Haggah, the Rema, that he says, you see what he says, Limed Rabbeinu Armaz Zchut al Kral Yisrael. He also said in the previous one, Lelamed Zchut al Kral Yisrael. Lelamed Zchut means that we need to justify reality. These are the rabbis dealing with a reality that does not agree with them. They see Orthodox Jews, observant Jews, boarding ships, traveling on Shabbat. How are they going to explain that? They, either they say all these people are transgressors or they say, no, we have to understand halacha differently. So Rabbi Epstein in our Rosh Hashanah says, I, could, uh, I have two different ways to, um, to defend my, my clients, which are Klal Yisrael, the people. One is that the prohibition applies only when, to a ship where the owner is a Jew. Also, he quotes the Rema, who says that only when you go for leisure is, uh, is called Reshut. Um, so already the Rema writes that most people are lenient and they travel before Shabbat. Even if you have enough food, enough money, but you want to make more, it's still called a mitzvah. And even more so, if you're going to collect a debt, if you don't go today, you're going to lose it. And uh, definitely to, you're on one side of the river and they need a minion on the other side, you could go. The, uh, the shuttle that is called Param, is maybe a... a a flat, bigger uh, raft that goes from one side to another, was in a small boat, there is a debate, some say yes, some say no, and in Germany, the Minhag is to be lenient and to allow it, probably because they had more, uh, had more rivers and rivulets, and they had a situation where they really had to, if they were be, remain isolated on Shabbat. Um, we're not talking about that. Animals pulling uh, I mean, boats pulled by animals. We don't have that anymore. Uh, okay. Okay. So we're done with this siman in, in the in the Aruch Hashanah. So go. I'm getting out of the screen, and let's talk about uh, some of the modern uh, modes of transportation that we have today, and the and the opinions of the poskim. So we're, we're now talking about the, uh, um, the malachot leading to Shabbat. You're boarding a vehicle before Shabbat, and you're going to travel the whole Shabbat. So, uh, wait, I see. Yosef, you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering about, as far as a limud zchut goes, does that work the same way as psak? that once the rabbi writes their limut schut, could someone then rely on that as psak and then make their own position more lenient? 
I think that yes, if you look if you look throughout the history of halacha, you will find many situations where the limud zchut uh, becomes becomes a, uh, a psak. Um, but you also see the reverse. You'll see the the trend that two or three generations later, someone picks it up and says, "No, you can't do it because the um, the the argument in the past was only a limud zchut." So it's really a, um, I would say it's a uh, it's a double-edged sword that is used by by the posek. You know, one would say limut schud, I defend them, and that's the halacha, and people could rely on it. And the others say no, it's only limut schud, and it doesn't work. The and then that is really the um, I think the uh, the serious battle that we have. Uh, that we have today in in the halachic world is that um, we there are, there are, there is a system that tries to impose the same rule for everyone, and maybe does not understand the limud zechut. And the limud zechut, I think, is is really uh, a different way to say people assess reality and act according to necessity, right? That's the limud zechut. There's a need, and for the, you need. You're being resourceful within the within uh, the realm of halacha. So um, I want to answer also this question that was brought up in the chat about um, a ship that is operated by a Jew, right? Um, so we'll have to if a ship is operated by a Jew, there are, there are two two situations or two two scenarios. One is that the Jew is the owner of the company, and the other is that the Jew is uh, physically operating the ship. So if the Jew is the owner of the company and, and the ship sails on Shabbat, then we combine the halachot that we learned in the previous simanim with that siman, that um, if the ship is run or, or the, the line is run in a halachic manner, by partnership or any other um, any other method, then you're okay being on the ship on Shabbat. When um, when the people on the ship are uh, the people who operate the ship are Jews, then you might have a problem. So, but for that, what you'll have to do is really um, get to know exactly how the ship works and who is essential and who is not essential. And if the, and then when you find that the, the, the essential people for, uh, for the ship's uh, operation are Jews, then you have to assess whether their operations are biblically, for, biblically forbidden or not on Shabbat. And then, and then you should decide. So we could say that it's, it's uh, probably improbable I don't know if there are uh, cruise ships owned by by uh, by Israel or by Jewish owners. Um, I I really don't know. It's a it's a question. Um, but the question would really be what is the exact prohibition and how it is done. So we really have to. It's a case by case basis when you have to. Uh, so when in doubt, uh, if you know that the line. Is owned by uh, the whole line is owned by a Jew. Maybe you want, maybe you really want to make uh, some investigations before, uh, or go on a kosher cruise or something like that. Uh, but that that has a, a implication. One second uh, before we go to that, um, the uh, uh, the question from Yossi, like if doing business on Shabbat is considered var mitzvah, it op- opens up many leniencies. So that is, that is truly interesting that they said that going for business is a var mitzvah. That shows where rabbis understood the necessity. They didn't say that conducting a business on Shabbat is a mitzvah, but rather that going for business. You, you know, you have to, to travel three days or three weeks or three months to do business. Um, and thank God that they they understood those openings because if that would not have happened, Jews would never have gotten to the new world. They would never have gotten to the Netherlands or wouldn't do what they did 
in the past. They realized that this is um, uh, this is a uh, uh, a case where the rabbis understood reality. And now I see also that that uh, we we got that uh, information that the carnival is owned by a Jewish family, but we have to check corporate structure. This is along the lines that Menashe. Uh, uh, mentioned last uh, last week. Okay, so before you go on carnival, uh, make sure exactly how this is operated. But again, if uh, even if it's owned by a Jewish family, um, if the operators of the ship, most of them are not Jewish, then um, you'd be okay. Okay, um, so now we just um, <laughs> We have to speak probably next next week about other modes of transportation. We talk about uh, bicycle and skateboard and cars and all that. But um, within this uh, scenario of boarding a vessel or a vehicle before Shabbat and it continues into Shabbat, <clears throat> probably the most common thing is um, today either a plane or a cruise ship, but there's also a possibility of a train that uh you know long distances and with well, the train would be it seems that it would be a problem because you're traveling within the home but since the uh usually where you are seated on the train is higher than 10th for him then you're not traveling in the in the tomb um it seems like though that most with most trains you wouldn't be in a situation that you have to travel you know specifically on shabbat but uh, we would using the same parameters. We could apply them to the train. Um, there will be a slight difference between whether the train is electric or coal. I don't know that they still use coal trains uh, um, in America, do they? I'm not. Uh, no, right? Okay, uh, steam engine. By the, I'm really not. Uh, so most of most of them are electric. No, we have to we have to look into this one. Um, uh, or their diesel, or diesel. Okay, so diesel is is a uh, is a combustible combustion engine. Um, but your so the, one of the one of the common arguments, and then we'll talk about when we talk about uh, smaller vehicles, and usually on Shabbat because we talk about shorter distances. One of the common arguments is that when you uh, you are on a vehicle which travels on Shabbat, your body weight changes, uh, causes the, that vehicle, that vessel to consume more energy. So obviously when we talk about a train or a ship or a plane, uh, hopefully we're not that heavy that, you know, that we are going to be the ones who change uh, the, uh, you know, the energy consumption of that, of that uh, vessel. But people argue that about, about a car, let's say you need to ride a, you know, not an emergency, but you want to join a, someone who's driving to visit someone in the hospital on Shabbat, so you can't get in because you're going to cause the car to to burn more gas, or even um, in buildings, in uh, observant neighborhoods where you have a Shabbat elevator, or hospitals where they have Shabbat elevators. Um, I lived in a building in Israel with a Shabbat elevator, and there were uh, there were neighbors of mine who refused to use the elevator, so uh, because they argue that that entering them causes more energy to be to be spent, and the, the um, we understand their argument, but the counter argument is that the uh, the the added energy that is being spent for me as a passenger is a negligible. Second, once the the uh, um, the elevate the elevator or the car operates, it doesn't matter if there are more people or or less people because the the action is already uh, in motion. Um, okay, uh, last, last thing I want to answer Ben's question because it's really, um, it's, it's, it's intriguing and actually, uh, in a way, even though you ask about ancient Israel, it circles all the way back to today. So Ben has this, it says, uh, I meant much, not so much from a perspective, from a perspective of ship's passengers. Let's say in ancient Israel, hypothetically, there were only Jewish sailors, and not hypothetically, really, they were all Jewish sailors, even though they relied heavily on the Phoenician uh, seafarers, but we know that uh, 
the, the Torah speaks about Zevulun as a tribe of, uh, of seafarers. How would they get the ship anywhere further than six days of sailing? Were they expected to drift? No. So uh, they, the, the people of Shlomo sailed all the way to Africa and back. Uh, and not necessarily they stopped in between. So uh, the answer is that they just kept on moving on Shabbat because they had to. They had no other option. And I'm saying that it circles back to modern Israel because um, every once in a while you have a, a scandal in Israel when a certain work of maintenance, especially with the electric company or, or roads, uh, highway, uh, you know, rail tracks, has to be performed. The only time you can do it on Shabbat because you, you, you need to uh, know that uh, window where nobody's on the roads. And there was one time when they had to move turbines from one side of the country to another. And the only way to move them was on the main road, Kvish uh, Hag or Kvish Arba, one of those. And one politician from a religious party, I think it was Shas, made a, uh, made a ruckus and said, you cannot do it. Um, and they sent protesters there. And the police and the government said, there's no other way, no other day we could do it because those are huge trucks that would just close the, the, the road for traffic for hours on end, would mess up the whole country. Um, so they ended up delivering the turbines on Shabbat with hundreds of protesters, hundreds of police cars, causing Shabbat transgression on a much larger scale that would have happened if they keep, kept quiet. So Rabbi Lopez Cardozo brought up this issue uh, a while ago with that question. He says, what, you know, the Orthodox people, we also, uh, we aspire, apparently, to have a state where everybody's religious, right? A sovereign Jewish state. And let's say, ideally, you want that state to be only Jewish, in, both in terms of citizens and workers, it was purely Jewish, beautiful. Then what do you do on Shabbat? What do you do with the army? What do you do with the, uh, with the maintenance of the roads, of, uh, with fire trucks, with the water, everything? It means that if you run a country, a full-scale operative uh, country that is all Jewish and all observant, you will have to do those things on Shabbat. You have no other choice. So maybe you'll make shifts, you know, uh, but then, then we'll, we'll have to go to the next level of argument. Well, that would mean that in that construct, I don't know if Rabbi Cardozo said that, but I'm, I'm, I think that's, the, that's, the, that's how we should look at it. In that construct, that is not called Hilul Shabbat because that's the way the world operates. There's no other way to do it. Where do we see this happening? We have a model for that. The temple, Bet HaMikdash, has a certain schedule and a certain routine that has to be carried on every day. Maybe that's why the Torah commanded us to maintain that model of Bet HaMikdash. Because in Bet HaMikdash, the Kohanim would sacrifice on Shabbat, would feed the fire on Shabbat, would do all the things that you're not allowed to do to tell you that the core, if we look at the... Uh, if we look at the Beit HaMikdash as the spiritual core, the engine of, of the nation, then we realize that if the whole nation is Orthodox, then the, its engine must keep kept running on Shabbat by observing Jews. So I think that there, that is where we have the uh, correlation. And, um, and uh, I think that is a, is a good note to end on. Um, that you know, hopefully we hope for uh, for a state. I don't want to say that everybody's observing, but at least that everybody understands each other and and respect each other's uh, boundaries. So I'll stop the recording here and remain for some more questions. A little bit unique for now. Here, one. Yeah. Any any questions? I will still still remain on the video. Uh, I just want to re address one second. I'll just tell you that the recording went, the full recording, so this issue is fixed. Um, I agree with you also that maintaining the state of Israel is the Bar Mitzvah. 
And also, as Israela says, it's not easy to, uh, to search the ownership of, of ships. It's, uh, it's an irony because there's ship and ownership, right? <laughs> but um, in so many, actually, so many thrillers and also in real crime scenes, uh, this is how usually people uh, uh, evade legal uh, consequences by sailing under different flags. You don't know who the owner is. Um, that's true. Okay. Uh, any more comments, questions for tonight? I have a question. On, uh, can yes, you Shana. elaborate <clears throat> more on this, the concept of Dvar Mitzvah? Because that was very confusing to me when all of a sudden Dvar Mitzvah was going somewhere for commerce. And so I yeah. understand the term and the concept. So, so the Dvar Mitzvah, like I said before, for commerce is that you need to cover the distance from here to there. And the only way you could do it is on Shabbat. You're not doing commerce on Shabbat. But if you don't get there, you'll never be able to do it. So that's why it was allowed. Um, there's an interesting... Um, discussion, and that is when uh, the, uh, you know, when, when uh, Rabbi Yosef Haim allowed riding bicycle on Shabbat, he said the Deval Mitzvah, you could do it. Um, and Deval Mitzvah was a question of like, what is exactly Deval Mitzvah? Is it, uh, like you said, to, to complete the Minyan or not? And because the um, the the act of riding a bike is not in itself uh, a transgression. the The idea of Dvar Mitzvah has been expanded to even uh, you know visiting family uh, or even for leisure. If you need for you know to to maintain health and physical or emotional health, that it would be okay. And then if it's Dvar Mitzvah, even if there's no eruv, without relying on Rabbi Mesas, you could still ride the bike because you're not carrying them, they just stroll. So, yes, Dvar Mitzvah is in a way uh, ambiguous, the definition. It's, you, could, you could argue that anything that has direct benefit to your soul or body is Dvar Mitzvah. So that is the, uh, the argument there. Okay, uh, I'm stopping the recording here. I'll share it later. Um,